coming up on today's message with Pastor Johnny. To live is Christ and to die is gain. But when Jesus said that I came that you might have life, and have it more abundantly that was not just for you to die and what was going to happen in the sweet by and by that abundantly in the greek was overflow so there were things that were going to overflow out of heaven and operate in your life in the natural right now salvation Good morning, church family. Turn with me, if you will, uh, to Philippians, the first chapter. Uh, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians, the first chapter. And I will be starting with the 21st verse, reading from the New King James Version. Hear ye the word of the Lord. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for all your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, church. God, we thank you for another opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way, uh, putting food on our tables, uh, clothes on our backs, roofs over our heads, and being in our right minds, Lord God. We ask that you be with us as we go through this week. Give us the ability to make it day to day. Forgive us for any sins that we have committed by word, thought, or deed, Lord God, against your divine majesty. And help us to forgive others for that perfect prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, said, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord God, I ask that as I come before your people to preach your word, that every word that I speak and every thought that I think be acceptable in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, For the time that is ours to share together, I would like to talk a little bit about I ain't never scared. Yes, I know I have an undergraduate degree and two master's degrees, but I said it the way I meant for it to be said. I ain't never scared. It's a line from a song that I uh, came out of about a year after I got out of college. And when I remember that song with the same line, uh, uh, with the line in I Ain't Never Scared from a song called Never Scared, I thought about this passage of scripture while I was uh, preparing. While I was looking through this scripture, I was thinking about the song. And when I started thinking about the song, I started thinking about the scripture preparing this sermon Uh, I ain't never scared. Paul's letter to the 
Philippians, the church at Philippi, written somewhere around 50, uh, common era. Uh, the church was located in eastern Macedonia, or what we would call northern Greece right now, a small town by our standards, a uh, bedroom community, if you will, with an estimated population of about 10,000. Uh, the city was founded by immigrants, uh, known for its gold mines, uh, but by the time this letter was written, those mines would have been already mined out. And by the time this letter was written as well, um, even though it was founded by immigrants, uh, Philippi, the city would have been taken over, infiltrated, uh, gentrified, if you will, by the Romans. And while it was still considered uh, a quote unquote independent city, all of the right government positions would have been held by the Romans and it would have been enough for them to control the city after they took it over and pulled back. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can do with the right people in the right positions. That's why certain uh, things uh, go on. That's why I often say that local elections are way more important than national elections, your school board elections, your mayor elections, your city council elections, your county sheriff elections, your county judge elections, the local things that go on. Don't just vote at the top and close your ballot when it comes time to vote. Go all the way down because those local elections will affect you way more than the president will in your day-to-day -day life. They're all important. But understand that the local effects, and that is what is going on in Philippi. Acts 16 uh, tells us that the church was started somewhere around 49 to 50 CE, and, and the Philippian church treated Paul well. Uh, sometimes they made sure that the pastor was taken care of. They made sure that he didn't go anywhere alone. They made sure that he had resources when they sent him off. So he started churches and went in Philippi, uh, the church at Philippi, the Philippians church, took care of him. Uh, and they sent somebody with him. They sent funds and they sent somebody to travel with him, a young man by the name of Epaphroditus. Uh, but while they were going on those travels, Epaphroditus got sick almost to the point of death, almost died. And when he was recovered back to health, Epaphroditus decided he needed to go back, along with Paul deciding as well, that he needed to go back to the church uh, in Philippi. And when he went back to the church at Philippi, Paul sent this letter with him. Paul was put in jail while he was in Philippi as well because he casted out a demon. Uh, when you read in your, your, your Bible uh, other times, Acts 16, you'll read that Paul uh, had a woman that was following him around and she had a demon in her. And, and this demon uh, was causing her to do divination and fortune telling. And, and Paul casted the demon out of this woman. Well, some people did not like that. There were some business owners in the community of Philippi that made money off of this woman's fortune telling. And so when they got, when he caused the fortune telling to go away, they brought him before the Jewish magistrates, had him beat up along with Silas and put in jail. Uh, the businessmen had lost their cash cow. Uh, and, and so they put this person who had disrupted their economy, who had disrupted their status quo, upset their apple cart, if you will. They had him beaten and put in jail. But jail seems to be a common theme for those who oppose the status quo in pursuit of the greater good. Uh, Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison, which was not anything new. Martin Luther King got arrested time and time again. He wrote one of my favorite writings of his, a letter from a Birmingham jail from where you guessed it, in jail. M uh, Mandela was arrested as well. He went to jail. It's not unusual when people in power abuse their power and try to detract people from continuing the abuse by putting those people in jail. If they have a, a single figure that they can uh, 
pinpoint the, a single head that they can cut off, they will try to put that person in jail. So uh, Mandela was upsetting the apple cart, so he got put in jail. Martin Luther King was upsetting the apple cart, but he and he got put in jail. Paul was upsetting the apple cart going around these countries and these cities and these towns talking about this man named Jesus, upsetting the hierarchy, upsetting the government, the status quo. They were saying Caesar is Lord, and he was saying, no, Jesus is Lord. And so he got put in jail. So it is nothing new. Paul is in jail, and not only is he in jail at the time of this writing, one of many times he went to jail, but he's also potentially about to be executed. Uh, the church is having turmoil on top of that, and the city that the church is in has been gentrified, taken over, and a group of people out there following some man named Jesus have started to change the city, and the people in power don't like that. This should be expected, though, because in the gospel according to John, chapter 16, the 33rd verse, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, living this uh, life in Christ is not designed to be easy, but that does not mean that we are supposed to just lay down and just take it. Greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. We have to keep putting one foot in front of the other and do the work that Christ has called us to do. Even though the things are rough, we still have Jesus Christ on our side. The, the, and so Paul was telling these people that. He was telling them to have joy and not let your joy be uh, affected by what's going on around you. Because if you allow your joy to be affected by what's going around you, that's not joy, that's happiness. Getting some money can make me happy. Uh, 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 getting an extra scoop of ice cream can make me happy. Uh, teaching my child how to ride her bike yesterday. Yeah, they can be happy, but those are ex- eternal things, but the joy is knowing who you are and whose you are in Christ. And those things are nice to have, but the joy that we have in Jesus Christ, we cannot allow other things external to affect us. And so Paul was telling them that when he was quoting this, when he was writing this letter to them to understand about the joy in Jesus Christ. And he says at the beginning of the passage that I read for your hearing to live is Christ, and to die is gain. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. You hear that oftentimes if you go to a home-going celebration or a funeral or whatever, people get up and say that, and they want to quote it to make people feel better. And it's not a lie. Paul did say to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But when you read on, he says that he would rather stay here in the flesh to do the work of the Lord. We can't use what is supposed to happen in eternal life to, to, to forego and forget and wash our hands about things that we can change in our natural life. I'm going to say that again. We can't sit around and think about because of what's supposed to happen in the eternal life to, to then say that we ought not affect change and do the work of the Lord in our natural life. I've been online and I've seen some stuff, if I can just be transparent for a moment, that has made me sick to my stomach. People actually trying to use scripture and the fact that we are supposed to endure some hardness and some suffering to justify racist behavior that black people are just supposed to put up with it because the Bible tells us to suffer. It, is the microphone still working? Sick to by stomach. Yes, to live is Christ and to die is gain, but that theology is the same kind of theology uh, when, we, when, we mix, when we mix it up and say that you're just supposed to suffer and deal with it is what they use to twist and keep us in slavery. To live is Christ and to die is gain. But when Jesus said that I came that you might have life 
and have it more abundantly. That was not just for you to die and what was going to happen in the sweet by and by. That abundantly in the Greek was overflow. So there were things that were going to overflow out of heaven and operate in your life in the natural right now. Salvation, and when you break down salvation in the Greek, the sozo is not just about eternal life. It is about making your life around you better. Salvation is not about the sweet, just about rather the sweet by and by. We as believers need to work on making heaven on earth as well. The gospel should be stamped out in our lives. The gospel should be stamped out in our lives, not just on Sunday, but how we operate from Sunday to Sunday. You should be able to tell if somebody's a Christian, not just by when they go to church. Now, the gospel should be stamped out in our lives and lived in a single-minded loyalty. That means that our devotion to Christ should be more than anything else, including the government, including those social circles you're in, including these relationships that you may have. Your allegiance to Christ, your allegiance to the gospel of Jesus Christ should outweigh everything else. Uh (laughs) The salvation is a gift, not a goal. So you get saved and there is still work to do. Getting saved and going to church and doing nothing else is, is the same as trying to stand in a garage and call yourself a car. Just because you are in the building does not mean that you are actually doing the job. There is still work to be done. There are still people to be saved. There are still things to be done. And there is work to be done out here. Isaiah 1 and 17 says that to learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. James 1 and 27 says that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their troubles and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. They talk about the widows and the orphan and the stranger all over the Bible and says that we as believers are supposed to be taking care of them because you're supposed to, if you're in a position of power, you're not supposed to look down on people who have it worse off than you You're supposed to be working on helping them to get up to where you're at. That is pure and undefiled religion. That is why Jesus would have said, or did say rather in Matthew 22, when they asked him which commandment was the greatest, to love the Lord God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and a second was like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. We don't just do this thing called Christianity to come to a social club to act like a fraternity or a sorority that is not taking lines this semester. We are in this to be out and amongst the people. Everywhere you see church in the Bible, they are not talking about a building. They are talking about a people and how a people interact with other people. So we need to be singly single-minded in our loyalty to the gospel. Uh, But Paul says in the text that there are some things he doesn't know. And he says, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is needful of you. Uh, And he says that they only let your conduct in verse 27 uh, to be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. One mind, uh, striving together. Uh, Not just the people who were born in the right family to this particular church. Not the people who have been here decade after decade and ain't nobody else coming in. We got to strive together. Dr. Jamie Clark Souls told time and time again that you cannot be a Christian outside a community. All these scriptures go on and on and on to talk about what it means to relate to another person. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. It's your actions that make the difference. And so Paul says that he doesn't know because he is facing death at this moment. 
a possible capital offense. Uh, but Paul doesn't know whether or not he'll live or die. And Paul doesn't know whether or not the Philippians will be faithful to the gospel. But one thing he does know is that Christ will be glorified. Uh, Wayne Hartnett Jr., uh, the, the, the theologian better known as Bone Crusher, uh, released a chart-topping song in 2003 called Never Scared, featuring Killer Mike and T.I. Uh, uh, and, and to paraphrase what was going on, is, is, because we can't really sing the actual version right now, but to paraphrase what was going on, there was somebody outside of the club that thought he was weak. And so because that person outside the club thought he was weak, he had to go to the trunk to get something that would help give him some assistance because Bone Crusher had something with more power in the trunk that he could call on to rectify the situation. That was why he was never scared. He knew whatever went down, he had some power in the trunk of his car that would help protect him through the situation. Well, Bone Crusher wasn't the first one that was never scared. That is why he said for us not to be terrified of anything that was going on in the text. But Paul was never scared. Paul had something on the inside of him, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had something on the inside of him that gave him courage. Paul got power from the prayers of the people, and Paul got power from the Holy Spirit. And because he got power from the Holy Spirit, he was never terrified by his adversaries, and he kept doing the work of the Lord no matter what was going on. And not only did he continue to do the work of the Lord, he never let it stop his joy. And that same power of prayer that was working way back then is the same powerful prayer that can work now. That same Holy Spirit that was working back then is the same Holy Spirit that can walk now. And that same joy that we have in the work of Jesus Christ is the same joy that we could have never have. And this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world cannot take it away. Paul's courage comes from these prayers in the Holy Spirit, and we can do the same, so we don't ever have to be scared. And even if we are scared, we still don't have to freeze. We can still do the work of the kingdom because the hard work has already been done. The hard work was done when Jesus came and was born of a virgin. The hard work was already done when he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and rose again on the third day. The hard work was already done when he rose again with all power in his hands. The hard work is done. All we got to do is live out like he told us to do and wait for his return. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Don't forget to connect with me on social media, Pastor Johnny Simpson Jr. on Facebook, at Pastor J. Simp Jr. on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks again for watching, and God bless.